Um, all right, so, um, hmm. Whew. Was a, well, anyway, so this is a restoration. And um, uh, I talk a little about, about the picture before, um, before you see the, the DCP. That, that's, that's been worked on very, quite a long while, very uh, thoroughly also. Um, I get, you know, this unique world of the Age of Innocence, uh, violence and hostility uh, expressed through um, very elaborate etiquette and uh, a ritual. So really, for me, it was a fascinating um, overall view of a world that uh, uh, had all the same, basically the same passions, um, uh, but was hidden through this, uh, uh, behind this lace, in a way, there's very, very uh, intricate um, woodwork of uh, etiquette and and um, and extraordinary rituals. Also, with a well, uh, maybe a sweet kind of perversity of repression. Um, Jay Cox gave me the book back in 1985. I read it when I was in England, traveling in England. And it was right, about the right, we talked about it for a while, but uh, it was about the right time in my life that I, w that I was able to read the book. And, and the film, making the film uh, changed my life more than uh, in the years to come than, than I had expected or even thought of. Um, the women in the story are uh, very much in the forefront and really, really, really um, controlled the story in a way. Madame Malenska and uh, Mae Welland, along with the others. And there's also then, takes into question, always taking into question the nature of Newland Archer, whether uh, it's weakness and or um, ultimately a loyalty and obligation um, and finally responsibility to a world which uh, created him only too well. Uh, that's his choice, ultimately. But uh, in staying with that obligation and that responsibility, uh, he he holds it still knowing that that world could be gone 10 years from now, 15 years, which it is, ultimately. Um, memory, loss, uh, sort of a melancholia. Uh, I, I keep thinking of uh, Mr. Bernstein in Citizen Kane, yeah. you know, where he says, you know, there isn't one day that I haven't gone by that I haven't thought of that young woman I saw on the ferry 40 years ago. And this, of course, is, is more explored than that, but that's the idea, and that's one of the things that, kept, that uh, really, really uh, uh, connected me with the material. Um, it, it, yes, it, when it came out, it was 1993, yeah. right? 93, 20 years ago. 20 years ago. Wow. And uh, it was, a, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, uh, a lot of the people were um, certainly against the decision that uh, Newland made um, or makes. Uh, it's hard to say, but it's basically it's a, long, a longer issue. But that is the uh, uh, it's unacceptable, I guess, in our our world now. Um, uh, the sense of freedom. If you have a chance of freedom, take it, go for it. Ultimately, you know, the, when you get it, what do you do with it? And um, that's some of the issues that, and some of the aspects of this picture and this story of Edith Wharton's that we kind of savor over the years. Making the film and thinking about the film when we do, my friends and myself, we kind of bring these issues up. Yes, there's, there's also a lineage to the picture, yeah, in other films. Like, you know, I grew up watching um, the American films of Jean Renoir, uh, uh, Letter from an Unknown Woman, and other films by Ophuls, uh, uh, the Visconti films, but those are rather lofty in this, in this case. I don't say it's up there with, with them. It's just that they permeated my life along with uh, the noir films and the Hollywood musicals and westerns and the, the Italian new realism. But there was something going on, an undercurrent of uh, films, which I, I, I don't want to use the term costume pieces, but um, period pieces, uh, particularly by Ophuls and, and Visconti. And who? Yeah, oh, and Ambersons, uh, Orson Welles' Ambersons, of course. Um, anyway, just quickly, uh, Dante Ferretti and, and uh, Francesco Lo Schiavo, they, they did a remarkable job on the production design. Uh, and you have to please remember that um, when you see this, that um, none of these places really exist. It, it, you know, in England and France, you, the, you can go into actually a, uh, a chateau or a, um, an estate, um, and uh, there's your production design. 
I'm not minimizing, but because this interior design is a lot of other things, but the buildings exist. None of that exists anymore. 1870s New York, you may be shocked to know, doesn't exist. <laughs> We have a tendency to want to build, especially very big buildings on 57th Street, mm. <laughs> which has stopped the production of my one new film twice. Yeah, one block in particular. <laughs> I want to say anything, I want to get into that. But anyway, you know, he had to go. Literally, there were some places we found in Park Slope, interiors, and a few exteriors in Troy, New York. The rest was sort of created by Dante, and, and of course, through the um, wonderful photography of Michael Ballhouse and uh, Jay Cox and his. Um, giving me the book in the first place, an old, old friendship goes back to 68, um, and uh, writing it together with him. Uh, credit sequence um, by Elaine and Saul Bass, Elmer Bernstein's score, and um, Gabriella Prescucci's uh, costume design, which she got an Oscar for, and of course Thelma Schoonmaker, who edited the film with me. So we have Joanne Woodward's beautiful voiceover in the film, narration which uh, tries to capture some of the, uh, the beauty of the language of Edith Wharton. Um, and of course the leads, um, Michelle Pfeiffer, Winona Ryder, is remarkable in it, and the great Daniel Day-Lewis. Um, as for the restoration, well, the restoration you're about to see was made certainly possible by Cineric Lab. The Prasad Corporation, is that the right pronunciation? Prasad? And uh, thank you. <laughs> Colorworks and, of course, Sony Pictures. They, they, I was really pleased last year when they said they were going to restore this. I hadn't, I hadn't asked for it, but it, it's, uh, they did a wonderful job. So the original camera negative was taken, and it was scanned at 4K, um, wet gate at Cineric, and um, files were moved to Colorworks. That's uh, the restoration and the digital intermediate facility that's at Sony uh, on the lot. And uh, keeping the work at a 4K uh, level, colorist uh, Sherry Eisenberg and, of course, Grover Crisp went through the film for color timing, grading, referencing a number of prints that we had. The picture was shot originally in Super 35, so you couldn't make a, a married print from the original negative. They were separate. It was, it's a very uh, complicated situation, but they were able to get some uh, good reference prints. The 4K uh, files then sent to Prasad Corporation for digital image uh, restoration, uh, removal of dirt, um, uh, uh, chemical stains, but primarily a couple of reels were, were badly scratched. And uh, at that time, before the film was gonna be released, I remember the guys at the lab were actually painting out the scratch if they could by hand uh, in one shot. Uh, but here, they were able to, um, uh, through a, a combination of automatic and, and also manual uh, processes, they, they were able to repair the damage. And so, uh, certainly, I gotta thank Grover Crisp and Sony Pictures for this um, uh, wonderful restoration. Kristen Andrews, who was the project manager. Jesse Morrow, the visual, uh, 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 visual uh, special effects supervisor at Colorworks. Sherry Eisenberg, the colorist, who spent hundreds of hours on this. Uh, Michael V. Fernandez, and special thanks to Scott Brock. Uh, and of course, Mark McElhatton, uh, with his uh, wonderful guidance. Thank you very much. I, I um, Take a look. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank him. It was his idea to show it here. Thank you, Kent. Thank you. Do I go up this way? No, let's go this way. Okay.